Look, it's been uh, an intense day. You've had a lot of information passed your way. What I'm going to do with my talk is, is actually take the, uh, the theory, the numbers, and show how we've been able to apply this. So as you walk out of here today into the real world of trying to apply everything there, I'm going to give you some examples of how we've done that. Lord Layard called the development of well-being and science around happiness a key development in world culture. Um, it is, but we've got to be pragmatic about this. Governments will not implement well-being unless there's a fiscal reason for it, unless there's money. Thomas, you had a great point earlier. Companies won't do it. Companies and governments are short-term organisations. They're in power for about four years, takes them about six to nine months to get their feet under the table. They need numbers, they need outcomes rapidly. Um, Marty Seligman quoted uh, Michael Gove, um, the UK education minister for the moment, um, and um, they said, he, he said all he's interested in is will this improve literacy and numeracy? Well, you know, it took a couple of years work. Oh, it turns out it does. You know, it's not just about improving happiness. Um, but you can understand Michael Gove. He, he, if this takes four or five years to really change things around, he's not going to be there in four or five years in all likelihood anyway. You need quick outcomes. So hopefully, my talk will be a little bit realistically optimistic. <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive. Now, when you think about governments, there's only about five places, five opportunities where they might be able to implement well-being interventions, where they've got a citizen in the palm of their hand where they can do something with them. This is in the armed forces, in prisons, I'll point at you again, um, <laughs> um, when they're in education, uh, when they need health care, and then my particular focus, when they're in need of welfare support. Uh, when they're unemployed. For me as well, the welfare budget in Australia is 50.4% of the entire federal budget in Canberra. That's the largest single budget. Specifically, we're talking about $18.3 billion this year spent on services to get people back to work. Centrelink, outsourced employment services, benefits payments. That's the tip of the iceberg for the unemployed. They get housing benefits, etc., etc. But there's something interesting going on around the world at the moment. And the figures from the United States just last month showed that 4.1 million US adults are now considered long-term unemployed. At least six months, but many of them you know, could be six years or so unemployed. This is increasing. It's a trend seen around most of the Western world. That is about 40% of the 10.9 million US unemployed. It's a trend that's increasing. Why are there fewer and fewer, um, I think they call it uh, fractional or frictional unemployed, where you drop out because your company's gone bust or there's an economic change or a technological change and you quickly get back into work. No, there's a, a, a greater proportion of people being long-term unemployed, perhaps generationally unemployed. Your father or your mother or your grandfather didn't work either. And there's been a few theories as to why this might be. Is it due to the emergencies of the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India and China? Possibly. Are there fewer jobs in Western nations because they've gone to these? Possibly. But where most of the hand-wringing and theorising has come from is, is there an increased entitlement, a sense of entitlement to welfare? Now, a couple hundred years ago, if you didn't have a job, if you weren't bringing in any money or anything to barter with, your family would crowd around, look after you, and then as soon as an opportunity came up, they'd push you into it. Now it's not like that because you get this handout from this, this faceless state. The irony is that the term welfare was really coined in late Victorian times because people wouldn't accept charity. People just wouldn't accept government handouts. So they said, well, how can we give them a sense of entitlement? I know, we'll call it welfare. No, no, this is your welfare. You know, we're looking after your welfare, da, 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 da. <laughs> the irony now is it's been too successful. You know, people have this sense of entitlement. So what do we do about it? Well, don't worry, and we've all done a lot of bashing of GDP and economic theory and policies, and I'm going to do exactly the same. <laughs> Now, GDP, I've got a, a couple of lovely quotes here, I put on my pretend glasses. Um, there's a gentleman in 1934 called Kuznets, called GDP an oversimplification. 
1962, uh, he, he, 30 years later, he called it, look, the welfare of a nation can scarcely be informed or inferred from a measurement of national income, such as GDP. The reason why this bloke's relevant is he wrote it, he devised it, he did the initial Congress report in 1934 during the Depression. He said it's an oversimplification. There's another issue with economics, is it presumes that humans act for net gain. Okay? Everything we do is predictable. This is how you can develop policies, because we will act for net gain. Now, that isn't true. I saw how much cake was eaten. <laughs> there was loads of fruit there, nearly all the cake went. So, <laughs> we are rubbish. Humans are rubbish at self-regulation and self-control. In fact, that via me strengths, signature strength survey, out of three million people that have completed that, the bottom of the 24 strengths is self-regulation and self-control. We do not act for net gain. Even Adam Smith, the father of economics, said that humans and economics are driven by man seeking to be worthy of others' admiration. We're trying to impress each other, or at least avoid embarrassment. Check my flies aren't undone, right? <laughs> okay. So it's interesting, but now we don't have to rely on economics. We have behavioural science, 40 years of it, that enables us to more accurately predict how we're all going to behave, how the electorate are about to behave. The only problem is it's mostly supermarkets and ad agencies using this science. We need to use it more, and we have been. So what I'm going to do in this little talk is talk through the issues in the welfare sector in particular. This is really relevant to us. Now, most of us focus on, on children so that we can give them a really good start in life. We've got a really brilliant foothold here in South Australia. But what happens when you're an adult? What happens two kilometres up the road when Holden closes? Is it, oh, well, if only we'd got to them 20 years ago and made them resilient at school, they'd be able to cope with it right now. Can we do anything with adults? That's what I'm going to explore. I'm going to look at conventional wisdom and scientific fact, what we did about it, the research studies we undertook, and the results and implications. Right. So, it all started for me when I was but a twinkle in my mother's eye. Did you see what I did there? Uh, <laughs> three hours that took. Um, but this was me. As you can see, as an as a eight-year-old, I was severely disadvantaged. I had bright, curly ginger hair. Um, so much spit went into my hair for the school photo there, just to slick it down. But I grew up in Frian's estate, it was called, in Basildon, a new town just outside of London that was uh, an architect's dream. It was developed for people who were becoming more affluent, that wanted to move outside of London, uh, be nearer the seaside, nearer the countryside and move forward. It, it, was, it was a beautiful concept. The reality was something different. This really is Frian's estate, that really was the design for the Frian's estate. <laughs> And the real, but what I found here was that you'd have two children, there are, how many homes there? Eight homes, masonettes they were called, very nice. Um, but you'd have two children born right next to each other in these two masonettes with similar issues, similar levels of disadvantage and deprivation. Their father was in prison, they had five or six brothers and sisters, they had two rooms between them, their mother was unemployed, had alcohol abuse issues, obviously I'm not talking about my mum, this is being filmed, so I better not. Um, <laughs> and what was fascinating, what was obvious to me as even a ginger eight-year-old is that I saw that one child would see this as a barrier to progress. Um, they'd see this, they'll be citing these issues for the rest of their life. They'll be talking about, yeah, well, I can't do that, you know, we haven't got a car, we can't get anywhere, and da 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 da. Whereas another child will cite exactly these same issues as the whole motivation for them succeeding and moving forward in life. It seemed to me that the greatest barriers were mental, were psychological. So, hence my, my focus on this. The other reason, where is she? At the back, this is for you, Shereen. <laughs> She said, you know who you remind me of in the break? <laughs> Damn it. And I used to have a goatee, yeah. I'm much prettier. But for 10 years, I ran an employment services company. Um, and we built it up. We built it up, you know, from five staff to about 150 or so. Um, and then I ended up selling it to Anglia Ruskin University. But in those 10 years, there were a number of recurring issues that just had been there since time immemorial, you know, since the 40s with, with employment services. 
and they never seem to be properly resolved. For some reason in our industry, we had a huge turnover of staff. Now remember, these are employment service advisors. They're doing a job that's got immense meaning above and beyond them and their immediate family. You're trying to improve somebody in front of you and improve the, their, their lives, the lives for their family. And yet we had a huge turnover of, turnover of staff, often leaving our firm to go and join another firm for exactly the same amount of money. And every two or three years, there was this cycle going on. We also had a bit of an issue, there seemed to be conventional wisdom in policy. Conventional wisdom, often neither, um, and yet it seemed to be driving what we had to do at the coalface with unemployed clients. Up to 40% of interviewees, so people would be working with a long-term unemployed person, spend two years unravelling the onion, building their confidence, and then sending them off to an interview, phoning them up the night before, you, you really up for this, you sure? You, you'll knock them dead. And texting them the next morning, you're on your way, yeah, yeah, on your way, 40% still wouldn't turn up. It's like, oh my God. And the employers, you know, so annoying for an employer. And also, you get this with everything. Jose will get this, and we'll we, we address this um, with, oh, was it Jose or Julio, the, the gentleman um, gave the first talk. Why is it that some interventions seem to work, some people it seems to work with them, other people you look them in the eye and you're telling them what they need to do to improve their lives, it's so simple, it's so proven, and you just know they're not going to do anything about it. They just haven't bought into it, but they're nodding and going along. Why is it? How can you identify those people? So. I sold my business to this organisation, Anglia Ruskin University, uh, got married, found a wife in a catalogue, brilliant, emigrated to Australia a few years back, and um, the Vice-Chancellor of here, uh, Michael, Mike Thorne, he said, do you know, a lot of what you're starting to implement with this business, one of the reasons we've bought it, touches upon something called positive psychology. I've got a friend called Marty Seligman, you should have a chat with him. So I said, all right. He said he's just come back from Australia as well. He's been working over there with the Department for Employment, just trained up a couple of hundred people, started things going in Geelong Grammar. So I'd never heard of Marty Seligman, so I looked him up, started reading, Googled Wikipedia. So I got scared crapless about <laughs> phoning this bloke up eventually because he's a big cheese and grand fromage. But then, <laughs> as... Um, as we had, some of you might not have noticed this picture, but I found it from 1968 um, when I was doing some research about Marty, and you'd found it as well. This is what he looked like in 1968. <laughs> How can you be frightened of that? <laughs> Old huggy bear there. So anyway, but we had this conversation. He said, Darren, look, there's a, a lady I've been working with uh, called Lisa. Here's her cell number. Um, and what you, after the conversation, what you need to look into is comprehensive soldier fitness. I went, oh, right, that's lovely. Thank you. Put the phone down and said, what a rubbish conversation. What's fitness got to do with the unemployed? Anyway, I gave this Lisa a call. It turned out she was Lisa Paul, Secretary of State for Employment. Went down, had some meetings, which I'll relate in a moment. Um, and, but this comprehensive soldier fitness thing, I just parked it. You know, what's, that's irrelevant. It must have been a terrible phone conversation. But while I was researching Marty, I came across his learned helplessness studies, which a lot of you might have touched upon as well. Which, you know, to generalise, um, let's take the example of the German shepherds. Uh, you take a large dog, you put it in a harness, you give it mildly painful electric shocks for a number of hours. It cannot escape them. It has no control over this adversity. You do it on and off randomly. They did this with rats. Um, they did it with babies. But unfortunately, they couldn't electrocute the babies. They did sound things where they could move their hand in a shuttle box or turn off the sound. They even did this with fish. And what happened is, after you did that for a day, then you started to do it again the following day when that adversity is escapable. The dog could have ran away and got away from the electric shocks, 66%, two thirds consistently would just curl up because they learned the day before that this was an inescapable adversity. They'd learned to be helpless. Two thirds consistently, whether it's humans, whether it was rats, whether it was babies, goldfish, and, and German shepherds, two thirds in the face of repeated adversity, what they'd experienced that they couldn't escape from it, would just curl up, conserve energy, um, and not try and escape it. One third, would. One third would, as he coined it, re remain optimistic and they'd try to escape it. I'll come back to this in a, in a wee bit. 
So let's have a look at what I did with my time where I devoted myself uh, having run this business and sold it. I'm going to start researching this. I'm going to start doing a PhD. Why do we have a huge turnover of staff? I didn't get very far with this until I was out one evening on a drunken night. So I'll tell you about that. But the issue we have with working, and most of us have this when we're counselling, whether it's a family member, whether it's a school child, whether it's an unemployed person, they come in and they're sitting in front of you, you're in a position of power, they're kind of embarrassed to be there, and their optimism and mood is pretty negative. Now, particularly Poms and Aussies, you say to them, as your week gone, and we'll go, not too bad. That, that's as good as you'll get out of us. We kind of play things down. We had a guy two months ago that said, um, oh, how's your week gone? Not too bad. Well, he'd won us five grand on the scratchy the day before, and he was still saying, oh, it's not too bad a week. So people talk about this, and we can't help as empathetic individuals. Seventy percent of advisors say their greatest skill is empathy, but it's so easy for that to tip over into sympathy, which facilitates learned helplessness. But if somebody says, oh yeah, it's been a bit of a crap week, you know, I'm in a position of embarrassment, you're in a position of power, I know you're trying to build trust with me, but you know, oh, it was raining and I couldn't get childcare, it's been a terrible week, that's why I'm unemployed, you're no better than me. All of these thought processes that are going around and around in the head, you cannot help but have that conversation dragged into talking about issues, failings and problems. It is a pathologic environment when you're trying to get somebody back to work and you're advising them. It just gets dragged into that. I'll come back to that in a second. So this is me, and this is, uh, some of you might know him, Robert Biswasdina, the Indiana Jones of positive psychology. And we're out having a nice drink. Now what happened, this isn't about us, this is about this gentleman here. We'd been speaking at a conference in Brisbane, one Thursday night, it was a three-day conference, and we'd had the gala dinner, run out of alcohol, so we said, should we go up to the rooms, raid the mini bars? And this guy at the back said, no, no, you come with me, I know, I know a bar. So we go, okay, we're going to follow you, Marco. So he says, yes, you come. So we followed him, the bar was shut. Now this is Brisbane after midnight on a Thursday night on the South Bank, obviously the bar was shut. <laughs> But then he took us to another one. No, I know another. So he took us to another one, shut again. So I go, oh, bloody hell. I was insulting his intelligence, politely, of course. Um, then he took us to a third one. The guy was just locking up, uh, but the guy was Italian. Um, so Marco had a chat with him, and he opened it up. And as you can see, we got let in. And we had quite a few drinks. This is, um, uh, this is Marco. Uh, <laughs> this is Rocco Bilic, uh, an Academy Award-nominated uh, director of documentaries. Uh, that's a, a psychology groupie. Yes, we do get them. Um, <laughs> but what I want you to notice about this is Marco's shirt, the suit, the shirt, the crease in the shirt. And we carried on drinking until about 4 a.m. And then we thought, oh, God, we better get back. It's the headline act tomorrow morning, the Dalai Lama. We want, to, we want to see this. So we got back, crashed out, showered up, went back down, all sitting in the front row, about a thousand seater auditorium. Marco's not in his seat. So we go, ah, Marco, he can't take his drink. And we were all taking the mickey out of him. Dalai Lama gets on stage and introduces his special guest. It's <laughs> Marco. But what I want you to notice is the suit and the shirt, the fold is exactly the same. He'd obviously crashed out, then woken up five minutes ago, go, Oh, no wonder the Dalai Lama's leaning away, he obviously reeks of alcohol. Um, so then suddenly I wasn't calling Marco an idiot, because Marco was called up because he had headed research into mirror neurons, which a lot of you might have, uh, might have heard of. But I, I'll summarise this and why it was relevant, because I had a chat with him afterwards, I told him about this staff turnover issue. And he said, Darren, the issue is, is that um, we found that macaque monkeys, we, we, we found it um, when one was eating a raisin and, and, and then they re replicated it. When one macaque monkey watches another macaque monkey um, having a drink, the neurons that fire in its brain aren't, oh, I wonder if I'm thirsty, what does that taste like? They're reaching out, grasping, lifting, tasting, swallowing. And they thought, well, that's peculiar, an exact physiological mirror of what's going on in the monkey's brain that's actually doing it. So then they thought, well, let's try this on humans. So they did it with pianists playing, and these are the neurons firing up in the brain. 
and a pianist listening. Now these neurons aren't necessarily listening in pleasure zones, they're reading music, swaying to it, moving your fingers and what have you. And then they got non-musicians, people that can't even read music, and they measured their neurons. And some of these main zones firing up, uh, non-musicians trying to read music in their own mind, moving, this sort of thing, exact physiological mirrors of what you're observing going on. Now this is profound, it's a profound discovery. As he described it to me in my drunken state, this is proving that empathy is physiological, or it's suggesting that at least. Empathy is physiological. Now we've already known this for years, but we don't know we know it. If I fell off this stage right now, most of you probably cheer, but some of you will put your hands up and flinch. And if you see other people tripping over or spilling fingers on themselves, we often flinch ourselves because in our own brain it's happening to us. Now what he said to me is, you've got an advisor dealing with somebody five hours a day, five clients a day, five days a week, and this person's exhibiting all the symptoms of anxiety, stress and depression, then your advisors will have by the end of the week all the symptoms of anxiety, stress and depression. You have to turn this around. Um, and you do it by talking about purpose, strengths and successes. You don't do it by talking about your issues, failings and problems. We've seen as well, when you're unemployed, depression shoots up and other psychological issues kick in, mental health issues. So we've got to kickstart talking about those things. Forget the unemployed person, it's for the mental health of the advisor and the counsellor. Now this is fascinating. So we went away and did that. That's kind of answered why we have this burnout in an industry that has a huge amount of meaning. Now, after I spoke to Lisa Paul, the lady that Marty Seligman put me in touch with, I went into Canberra and had a meeting with a lady there that was talking to me. She was in charge of a program that dealt with the generationally unemployed. And she said to me, I said, how effective is it working with people where the mum, the brother, the grandfather, the daughter, are all unemployed in that same family. She said, you cannot measure the success of this just by how much it costs. Because it costs a lot, and we're kind of embarrassed about it. But there's a multiplier effect. If you get one person from long-term unemployed family into work, they're held up as a paragon, an example to the rest of the family. I thought, oh, this is brilliant. So next time I was on a stage talking to a couple of hundred employment service advisors, I repeated this thinking I sounded very intelligent. And I saw half of the audience started to roll their eyes and I lost them. So I stopped and said, well, why are you saying that? And they said, well, that is true in maybe one in 10, 10% of the cases. If one person from the family gets a job, the rest of the family rally around, they try and copy them. And 90% of the time, that person that's trying to get a job is undermined, they have the mickey taken out of them, they're ostracized. So I thought, well, I've got policy makers saying one thing, and then I've got people on the front line saying something totally different. So we mustered together, we worked with the uni at, uh, up at the Sunshine Coast, we undertook a study into in-group, out-group, you know, humans form in-groups, where you, know, you club together with people that support the same teams, beer drinkers, wine drinkers, you boost your self-esteem, self-confidence, by talking about the same thing with each other and taking the mickey out of people that haven't got the same interests, that support you know, Fitzroy or whatever it might be. What have you got here? Port Adelaide, Adelaide Crows or whatever. So it turned out there is a generationally unemployed in-group. That means if you try and extract yourself from your unemployed family, they will take the mickey out of you and undermine you and ostracize you. But to give you an example of what this, how this plays out in reality, how this is going to play out just up the road at Holden when those people are made redundant, is that a young boy comes in, he says morning to his dad who's having breakfast, maybe it's 11 a.m. His dad's unemployed, alcohol breath, shaven headed, 50 year old dad, and his son's wearing a suit, 20 year old son wearing a suit. And the dad goes, What are you wearing a suit for, son? And he says, Well, I've got an interview today, dad, I'm trying to, you know, trying to get a job. And he'll say, Well, you look an idiot. You, you, you're just going to make a right tit of yourself. <laughs> or words to that effect. Obviously, not the scientifically uh, utilised words. Now, that same dad will then go to the pub at lunchtime, one hour later, and see his mate there, also long-term unemployed, but his mate's wearing a suit, knocking back a Jack Daniels, and he said, well, what are you doing wearing a suit? And he said, well, I'm just getting a bit of Dutch courage, I've got an interview. And the bloke says, well, you look brilliant, you'll knock them dead. So the same dad, a generationally unemployed family, will undermine each other, but not their friends. It's a, it's a fascinating trait, but it bucks the trend against conventional wisdom. 
And it also gives us insights into how we should intervene because if you're seen to be from an out group telling somebody that's long-term unemployed and you look like you've never been unemployed in your life or you're from Oxbridge or whatever and you're telling them what they need to do, you are much less effective. You've got no credibility with those individuals. You have to be authentic, of course. You've got no credibility. So that was a fascinating insight, conventional wisdom. But it doesn't necessarily answer both of these. It might give us an answer as to why up to 40% of interviewees don't turn up. It's because they're all dressed and their dad's just taken the mickey out of them. A real example we got out of Bundaberg um, a few months ago is a person, a girl was on her way for her first interview, 18-year-old, and a nan had a right go at her, saying, you're so selfish trying to get a job. Who's going to walk my dog now? It's that sort of undermining thing. But some job seekers just don't seem to be trying still. Why is that? Nobody's really been able to put their finger on it. And in fact, in a meeting I had with the Department of Work and Pensions a couple of years ago, they said, Darren, if we have, so this is the UK Department for Employment, if we have one holy grail, it's to be able to identify in the first six months of being unemployed whether somebody's going to need help getting into work or not. Now, government... A government cannot afford to help everybody in their first six months of unemployment. The budgets just aren't there. But if you go beyond six months of unemployment, mental health issues kick in and employer prejudice, subconscious prejudice kicks in. And you're much less likely to get a job. You're much more likely to be long-term unemployed. The first six months of everybody at Holden after they've, they've, they've been made redundant are absolutely critical. So they said, but we don't know how to identify that. So all we do is we help people only after they're six or 12 months unemployed. So we do it on a time basis, unless there's a disability issue. So I went asking universities around the world, wrote to UPenn, um, University of Rhode Island, University of New South Wales, and actually Rhode Island came back to me and they said, we might have something that can help you identify this. And it was something called the Transtheoretical Model and Change by Prochaska and Di Clemente. And actually, this was something that my supervisor on the PhD had already told me about, and I ignored. And then it turned out it was genius. It's perfect. This has been used since 1982 with up to a quarter of a million Americans to try and cease smoking. And what they do, they've narrowed it down to generally about 12 questions, 12 items that you can ask somebody to work out <laughs> where they are in terms of their readiness to change behaviours. It's really elegant, really logical. If they're a pre-contemplator, they have absolutely no intention of giving up smoking. The pros are outweighed by the cons. If they're a contemplator, yeah, I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna do something about it, maybe in six months' time. If they're a preparer, then they want to give up smoking. They're getting leaflets, they're learning about hypnosis and, and, uh, and nicotine patches. And if they're in the action stage of change, they're doing something about it. They've got an armful of nicotine patches and being hypnotised or whatever it might be. Maintenance is obviously they've given up smoking, they're staying off the fags. Can we apply this to the unemployed? It had been applied in a, a small samples, a couple of small samples, to um, people unemployed due to disability or injury sustained at work. So this was in, of interest. Now, what we've found in the United States is that when you time interventions, what you say to the person with their stage of change, you can up to double effectiveness of that intervention. And it's obvious. If somebody has absolutely no intention of giving up smoking and you're spending an hour talking to them about nicotine patches, it is going to be a complete and utter waste of time. So we applied this to the unemployed. The only problem with this is that it was the scoring of it was paper-based. It took up to 24 minutes with our employment service advisors. So we turned it into uh, an online uh, survey and it took one second to score with 100% accuracy. There were 36% inaccurate scorings behind, b before. And the first thing we did was we did nothing with the unemployed people afterwards outside the ordinary. We just worked out what their stage of change was and then six months later saw whether they were in employment or education. And it turned out they were, it was a perfect predictor. If we found out that they're a pre-contemplator, six months later they were 20% 20 20 of them or 20% likely to be in employment or full-time education. If they were up here in the action stage of change, it was 50% likely to be in employment six months later. Very elegant, very, very straightforward. What's interesting is that 72% of interventions from unemployment advisors assume people are in preparation or action, CV or resume writing, interview skills, maybe in vocational qualifications. So hopefully 72% of the 
of unemployed people are in preparation and action. So we did our first trial, it was with people that were claiming disability allowance, um, so on DES, as we call it over here, and um, long-term unemployed, very long-term unemployed, and we found this. These were the results, the proportions. We found that 33%, a third of these clients were in action and preparation. They were up for a job. And two-thirds weren't. Two-thirds weren't. These are the people you look in the eye and you know they're going to do nothing about it. These are the people that have no desire to get a job or no confidence. No confidence to go for a job. But what some of you might have spotted here is this proportion is exactly the same as the learned helplessness results. What you're finding is that after years and years of knockbacks, adversity over which they seem to have no control, it seems, the data suggests, that the long-term unemployed or disabled unemployed are curling up, they're conserving energy, they're preventing embarrassment or exposure to threatening situations, in other words, going to interviews. And what it also means for us in, in terms of thinking about this is these aren't dull bludgers, they're acting in exactly the same manner as the entire animal kingdom. You know, they've done these tests on goldfish and cockroaches, German shepherds, we all act, all species act the same, we curl up, we conserve energy. When we did this with the general unemployed, so these might be people that have been unemployed a day, up to 37 years, I think the longest one was, you can see there's a different split there. It's almost 50-50. Half of all unemployed people kind of want a job, and half just don't believe they can sustain one or don't want to go for one deliberately. But there's something there I haven't mentioned, which is probably bugging a few of you, and that's this sector here, unauthentic action. It turned out this huge proportion of unemployed clients are in unauthentic action. That means that they're going for jobs, they're resume writing, they're, they're even sitting down at interviews, maybe even getting a job, but they're also scoring highly on pre-contemplation. They have absolutely no intention of getting a job. They don't want a job. These people are bullshitters. <laughs> and there's a much higher proportion of men in this group. Uh, interesting correlations. Whereas ladies form a much higher proportion of contemplators. Yeah, maybe in six months' time I'll do something about it. But when a lady seems to decide to want to get a job, she shoots straight up into action. Whereas a bloke having pretending to go for a job, he actually creeps into preparation, you know, building confidence. So it's fascinating, this data. We can also split it by stream. In Australia, you have a job seeker classification index, and by working out distance from employment, you're either a stream one, that means you're close to employment, you might be 23 years old, just left uni, uh, just signed on at Centrelink, um, you've got a, an engineering degree or whatever. Back to stream four, or up to stream four, where you're much less likely to be re-employed, or you're further away from the employment um, sector. These are the people in action. As you'd suspect, stream one's you know, 30%, stream two's 33%. But we've got 17% of stream fours there that are up for a job. These are in action. So making them do things like wellbeing and resilience courses is actually holding them back. They need practical things. They need resume writing, interview skills, job search skills. Now this is where we really salivated. When we looked at pre-contemplators, people with absolutely no intention of going for a job or getting a job, 13% of stream ones, people that are pretty much only just unemployed, have absolutely no intention or belief that they can get a job. These are the people that the Department of Work and Pensions said are the holy grail. We seem to have cracked it. It looks like we've identified who in the first six months of unemployment is going to need help? So governments can target these people. They can do different and more relevant and targeted interventions. You can adapt this, one theorises, to many things like obesity. Why do some people, the, the, the first comment, um, first talk today, why do some people actually follow through on interventions and end up losing weight? Why do others not? You know, it's because it's their belief. Do you want to lose weight? Yes, no, or maybe. Then you tailor the interventions to that. It's so elegant, but it's so obvious. So, what results have we had? This seems to answer, yes, we know why people might not turn up. We know why some just don't seem to be trying. But what do we do with them? And this is where the behavioural science kicks in. I'm not um, a disciple or an advocate of well-being or PERMA. But we've started to use it because it works. 
So we put together five workshops. We called it Applied Positive Psychology, Strengths, Resilience and Character. Um, in essence, we searched around, we scoured to try and find good interventions to do with unemployed people. The employment service provider said, how long do you need to train up our advisors to deliver these sorts of workshops? Five workshops they wanted them packaged into. And I said, well, um, I don't know, uh, two weeks, I said, to train up what are in essence master resilience trainers to then go out with the unemployed people and deliver this. So anyway, we spent months doing this and then suddenly I hit upon a phrase that kept on coming up over and over again where there was a good model we could look at and emulate, the, the highest form of flattery, may I say, and it turned out it was comprehensive soldier fitness. <laughs> so there was me two years before going, what's else this Seligman bloke on about? It turns out he was two years steps ahead of me saying, this is what you need to do, something like this with the unemployed. So we implemented this. There's still no guarantee that building an unemployed, this is one of those uh, learned helpless rats, but this, this one we've turned optimistic by gluing a teddy bear to his fingers. But there's no guarantee that by improving a long-term unemployed person's resilience and well-being that we'll get them into work. And there's another issue, again, been touched on a couple of times today, we cannot force them to do it. It's not like they're in score, they're in the army. Long-term or, or even recently unemployed people, as we can see, are non-risk-taking. I don't want to embarrass themselves. They've got fear of classes. Quite often when you bring a number of unemployed people together for a class, they don't know each other. It's the worst situation to be in as a human being. They're cynical. They're anti-anything motivational as well. We had to tone things down. And it's taken us a few years to contextualise to unemployed POMs and Aussies. There's another issue. They hate school generally. Now school, we've seen bell curves quite often today. You're always going to get 20%, 10% of people either end. This is the most efficient manner of getting through as many people as possible through education. But you're always going to get 20%, perhaps 10 to 20% of people that they're not mentally ready for learning French or algebra or whatever. Or you might have 10, 20% of people that are already there and they've gone and they're bored in classes. But this is still the most efficient for the masses. But what we now know from behavioural science is that human brains best retain knowledge in a different way from this sort of false feeding that you get in classes. To try and improve engagement, you need to do things in 10 month, 10, 10 month chunks, 10 minute chunks. So I've tried to sort of change things a little bit every 10 minutes here, but you need to gist of what you're going to learn and where you are in that learning. And you need regular jolts, hooks, and to capitalise upon the perversity of the human brain, the associative memory we have. If you tell somebody your name, a lot of you would have had it today, they won't remember it. But if that person that you've just told their name think, oh, OK, her name was Jane, I'm going to think of Tarzan. Next time you see her, go, hello, Tarzan. No, Jane. Um, that sort of thing. But our, our brains are peculiar. So we need these jolts and hooks and what have you. So we've had to put that in, in, into the classes. And as we've touched upon, again, humans evolve to function at their optimum, mentally, not physically, when walking 8 to 12 kilometres a day. This is where that 10,000 steps initiative comes from. Hang on, let me just try something. Yes. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> but with school children, those that are bored, fidgety, playing up while sitting down, well, they're just being human. We didn't evolve to be sat down. That's why some of the, the, the braver of the speakers have got you to stand up and, and move around. Children are expected as well to completely change personality the second they leave school. When you're at school, sit down, shut up, listen, do this, do that. You leave, right, I want you to be proactive, entrepreneurial and outspoken. Just like that. It just doesn't work. So we've had to take this into account when devising our interventions. So we put together 24 different exercises, each one academically validated, many that you'll find in the book Flourish, many you'll find implemented uh, in Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, and put them into, now this is terrible because we're trying to implement this, we're trying to convince employment service providers to give this a crack, assess the client, and then put them into different streams, not the ones that the government pays you for, and then do something different with those that don't genuinely want or feel that they can hold down a job. So I said, how long can we have them for? They said, well, five sessions, maximum two hours per session. So oh, blimey, this is light touch. 
positive psychology, light touch perma interventions. But we gave it a crack, and here are the results, which I'll finish on. The first time we did this was in Bundaberg about three years ago. The best performing generationally unemployed program that we could find in Australia, we're working with people that were totally unemployed, got 29% of them placed into work. That was the outcome. They took two years to do that. We had one year and we got 42% into work, into sustainable employment. So that was an encouraging start, but with 100 people in Bundaberg. Next, we work with Employment Services Queensland. This is complex, so you only have to focus on the bits I'll highlight now. And we assess them, and when they were pre-contemplators, contemplators, unauthentic actors, we then put them through workshops, but not one and a half thousand of them. We just, business as usual with those, they were a control. Two and a half thousand we did put through the workshops, and this is the difference in outcomes six months later. Had we increased the number that went into work with these light touch, sort of half day workshops, pre-contemplators we improved into work outcomes by 20%, contemplators by 23%, unauthentic actors by 30%. Now I was kind of disappointed in that, I thought well we're going to get we're going to get everyone into work after this. But no, what this means is that out of a group of 100 people, unauthentic actors, 30 more were in work than would have been in business as usual welfare interventions that have dominated the marketplace since the Second World War. This is a profound result, to quote the chief scientist of Queensland. Profound. If that's a bit complicated to understand, then we just say we introduced a model there to assess, assessment of, of um, a readiness to change, and then the applied positive psychology interventions, and they're the results, monthly into work results, and I'm assured that since September, because they're the last official figures, they've actually broken records every month as well. What I love is this as well, for Employment Services Queensland, we can look at the interwork interventions and, and, and placement rates per location, so we can see there's no macroeconomic, there's, there's not a Coles just opened in one particular town. And you can see these, all of these 22 different locations. This one there, Kiwana, we think, well, how comes those that didn't go through the Applied Positive Psychology workshops, how comes those that did, there's a four times better into work placement rate than here in Goodna where it actually went down. And this is brilliant because it turned out a lady in Goodna wasn't using our prezzies, she was just giving handouts and going off on her own. So there is, a, it, it proves the importance of quality assurance of that master resilience training for the people that deliver this. They have to rigidly stick to the academically evidenced interventions. Why was Kiwana so good? The chief executive space there. So everyone was sticking to it very <laughs> rigidly. But it enables you to performance manage overall, over across the whole organisation, notwithstanding the people that we deliberately didn't put through this as a control, their interwork placement outcomes went up from 16 to 20 percent. That's a 25 percent increase. Now, for Employment Services Queensland, and for me, and for the Michael Goes of England, and for the new government, all of this is great. Oh, are we making people happier, more resilient, well-being, that sort of thing? Well, who gives a damn? Because for a short-term democracy, it's money that matters. And these are the public purse arguments that ESQ put together. In those nine months, they got 780 additional placements they can directly attribute to the Applied Positive Psychology, the assessment and the app. Um, they're paid on average $490 a week, direct benefits payments, not including the housing benefits, healthcare benefits. These are the direct placements. So it saved the government almost $20 million. This is with about five or seven and a half thousand people in all. Now, what we're doing now, oh yes, uniquely in, in Queensland, unemployment went up during this period as well. What we're doing this year, we're having 100,000 Aussies and Brits going through the program. Now, if you can imagine what we did there, how much money we saved with seven and a half thousand people, then, then you can see the public purse arguments. It is not mutually exclusive, improving people's well-being. There is a fiscal short-term benefit to be gained here as well, which is very encouraging. So, as far as we can see, this is the greatest net uplift we can find anywhere in the world in terms of large-scale policy implementation, trying to get people back to work. 
And overall, we've just started. You know, what's changed in those individuals? Is it we've given them the resilience to walk away from their families, the only support network they've ever known? You know, is it the ignoring the dad taking the mickey? Have we improved community and connectivity by having these workshops in group sessions? Maybe. Which interventions have the biggest impact? Out of those 24 interventions divided into five workshops, are there 20% that are getting 80% of the impact? That's where we're going with the research now. But whatever, we've got a tantalizing glimpse now after 100 years of a welfare state of what can be achieved in a well-being state. So if we can leave you with anything from today as we're starting to implement this and we're getting results. So thank you very much. We've got a little bit of time for questions and then we're going to have a quick panel conversation. So have we got some questions for Darren? Think about the things we've been talking about today. This is a story about the way positive psychology interventions has made a real uh, issue. Is Bev still here from Northern Connections? Good, Bev. <laughs> No, <laughs> talk about putting you on the spot. Oh, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> I've got a lot of questions. I guess the first one is, Dan, where, you know, given the context of all that that you have alluded to, where would you start if you were us? You'd start pre-redundancy. You'd start as soon as possible, gearing people up so that the redundancy, that first day when they don't have to wake up at 7 a.m. to go to work isn't a shock, and then they start straight into that route to depression, anxiety, and stress. So you start now. Um, and again, it's not a labor-specific thing, or it's not you know, a Tony Abbott government-specific thing. It, it, you know, you've got the arguments there um, for both sides of the, uh, the political spectrum. But yeah, you need to start as early as possible. We can retrospectively try and fix them. That's what we've been doing. Or not fix them, but help them to fix themselves, start building their own resilience. But yeah, start, start as soon as possible. Thank you. Another, go on, Ben. And I'll just follow up today, start with what? Um, well, assess. We can't afford to help everybody, so let's allocate the funding we do have in the most efficient way possible. Are you up for getting a job on your own back, or do you need help? Uh, the beauty of the assessment as well is it's got a bullshit factor. Uh, I'm trying to think of a technical, scientific, academic term, but no, a bullshit factor in there that balances and allows for people saying what they think the, uh, the assessment tool wants to hear. So assess them first, see who's going to need help, and then just, just work with them. The key thing we don't say to the unemployed is, this is to help you get a job. Um, somebody mentioned earlier that humans resist what they're forced to do. You know, if Angelina Jolie walked in the room right now and just started you know, trying to sit on my lap, I, you know, get off Ange, it's a bit full on. <laughs> but if I, obviously. <laughs> but, if, but if I had to, you know, make, make a bit of going. So we say this is, it's, it's all about control, make, giving you a sense of control back. This is the core of learned helplessness as well. It's you, you've got no control over the adversity. We're trying to people, put people back in control um, so that they can make choices, build their own self-efficacy with small steps, small achievements, and then, then move forward from there. Angelina Jolie's in uh, Australia at the moment, isn't she? Hold on. <laughs> Uh, a question here. Hello, my name is Ross, I'm in Seymour College. Just wondering, have you um, tried any of these interventions in Indigenous communities? There's a lot of them, well, not very much hope, and a lot of those in groups. Uh, so one of our first questions were where can we test this in the most testing of circumstances. So we worked with Indigenous Job Connections in far north Queensland. Uh, we went there to train a number of their community leaders and people responsible for getting people into work. It was funny when I first walked in, the first of the two days to train them up, not the two weeks I had asked for, um, I heard one of them turn to the other behind him and say, here we go, another bloody seagull. And I don't know if any of you have heard of that term, seagull. Yeah, brilliant. You know, white fella comes in, squawks, makes a lot of noise, craps all over us, flies off, never to be seen again. <laughs> so that was the initial attitude, which you've got to expect. Um, but it worked, and they, they thoroughly enjoyed it. We, we, we got feedback from them, qualitative feedback. And I think one of the key things, one of their key issues is, look, Darren, I've got 2,000 unemployed Indigenous Australians in this region. There are four shops. They've all been there and said, got, got a job. 
They, they didn't, so that was it. What more could they do? And half of this is building the resilience of individuals to have to get up and move away from, again, their only support networks. Um, they call it a crab pot mentality as well. If one tries to crawl out of the crab pot and improve their lives, the others will probably, you know, possibly pull them back down. So that, that, that was a trend seen there. But it's to get them to move, a, a perfect flexible workforce, which any nation needs to be able to adapt that's what we've got to work on in, with Holden in North, North Adelaide. There's no point staying there, but when you're exposed to something that you're not familiar with in North Adelaide, being unemployed, you want to stay with your community and your friends. You want to meet up with them. You want to go down the RSL and feel some sort of sense of belonging. But the, there's no jobs there. You've got to move. So that's what we have to work on, the resilience. So yeah, it's fascinating. That was a thing we learned with indigenous communities that we can apply to any culture around the world. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Karen Gregory from Malay Community Centre. I guess my question is really just about um, and long term trends of those people that you are moving into employment, are they able to stay um, in employment? Yes. Very awkward question that I had to answer in Canberra. Um, and luckily the data's come in. Um, the figures for sustained employment, so the number of people that were still in a job six months after starting the job, um, in, in Queensland, for Employment Services Queensland, since 2009 was 52.9%. Um, in the last year it's gone up to 59.2%. So we're improving the sustainability of those jobs. They're sticking to them. There's two reasons for this, I guess. Um, one might be that unemployment's gone up. If you've got a job, you're going to stay at it because you're worried about being easily able to get another job. But the other thing is we're able to identify those unauthentic actors and work on their, their resilience, their genuine desire and belief that they can hold down a job. Because previously, you'd have 22% of unemployed people go into interviews, some of them even getting a job, but the slightest thing happens. They don't know how to photocopy or, or, or get a cup of coffee and they drop out of work just like that. Um, so yeah, it's improved sustainability. Something I want to ask before the next question, it's not really asking, but we've been talking about uh, measuring well-being in order to build well-being and we've been talking about when you measure what you value and we, we say in this room value well-being. <clears throat> but in the story you're telling us and the narrative of the, of the business you're doing is you're not measuring well-being, you're measuring willingness to uh, proceed into employment. Mm. Because that's the thing you value and that is. Yes, and we, we implemented well-being interventions, resilience interventions, on a hunch. And we're post-rationalising that for the, the, for the academic studies and what have you, because we had to stream clients, um, because cause budgets are tight, so we had to work out who to, whom to spend this on. Um, that's the next stage, that's the next part of my PhD. Were those that are up for a job scoring highly in well-being or, or, or low. We, we can all jump at conclusions, but yeah, you're spot on, that's the next stage. Did they have low well-being? Have we built it up? Are they more likely to re-enter employment? It reminds me a little bit of what I hear a lot of educators talking to me about, and most of you will know more about this than me, but I'm told that engagement is proven to be a critical issue in, in all the research in terms of indicating outcomes, successful outcomes. Yes, they're not, thank you. Um, and therefore, you know, um, therefore it's the same thing. What, 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 do, what do teachers and schools need? They need more engagement for better outcomes, but is wellbeing science offering ability to improve engagement? It seems it is. So it seems like it's a similar kind of intention, which is to use that applied science in order to achieve a, <coughs> a, a different goal. The goal is dependent upon the circumstance. So, any other questions? Yes, Shereen. Oh, thank you. My name is Sina. I was just wondering about the grant you had about uh, client interventions, um, where, where uh, the call advisors talked about focus, strengths and goals, certainly improve the outcomes and the mood of the participants. Now, given um, your work in an employment area, and um, especially you've shown the four um, levels um, where the job seekers are um, streams. streams, yeah, it's very much compliance based. Yes, and it's very little bit, uh, very little about people's strengths and goals. So, uh, can you have discussions about influences? Yes. 
that's, that's, that, that's spot on. And, and, and the Aussie government aren't blind to this. They know the job seeker classification index is rigid. It's a, a thing I spoke about in the Basildon estate, is that you're accounting for all barriers, but you're not accounting for their mental willingness, readiness or confidence uh, to change. So yes, they've, they've specifically um, addressed that by looking at can we integrate this, this readiness to change. But there's a problem. No, you can't, because we tried it in the UK in Job Centre Plus, and when somebody takes this, this uh, readiness to change survey um, with somebody in front of them that can sanction them, take away their benefits, if they don't overtly state that they're, um, that they're trying to get a job, then amazingly, 72% of people are in action and preparation. So, so it doesn't necessarily work in a Centrelink, but it works in a, in a Serena Russo, in a, a work directions or a job futures in, environment, those sorts of places. So yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Those, so oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so the, the outsourced government uh, marketplace, which is, you know, which is a, um, a model that's in most um, nations, Western nations now, except for the Nordic ones, which still uh, have got a lot more direct control and delivery. Interesting. Good. Um, I think we'll leave that there. Can I see that uh, round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks,